if you, um, essentially, the Ethereum ecosystem has been growing at a very steady pace in the last uh, couple of years. But if you look at uh, some of these Ether nodes websites which track the number of full nodes, you'll see that that one is kind of constant or maybe even decreasing. And why is that? Well, first up, because running a full node sucks. But, <laughs> and even though we're trying to solve that, um, the issue is that people will always prefer running a light client opposed to running a full client, or running info opposed to running a light client, or even uh, just using a RESTful API versus actually connecting to Infura. And this is kind of fine. People are kind of more or less aware of the implications security-wise that, okay, if you use a light client, then the security is not the same. If you use Infura, then you kind of trust them. You can maybe make a few proofs, but you still trust them. And if you use something like Etherscan, then you know that you cannot trust them, but yeah, you kind of trust them. So people can make balanced decisions. However, one thing that people don't really um, talk much about is what happens, for example, to metadata. What happens when you actually go from running a full node down to running a RESTful service, and how that actually changes the behaviors or the, the traits that you leave behind you? And that's exactly what I would like to talk about a bit in this talk. Specifically, let's start with Web 2.0 interfaces. Now, uh, my talk is relevant for almost any dApp that uses a RESTful service as a background. The reason I'm picking Etherscan is not to pick on them, rather because it's everybody knows what Etherscan is and how Etherscan works. So what is Etherscan? Just a quick, in a two-word uh, summary, basically that allows you to check your balances, your tokens, transactions, uh, events, etc. And uh, apart from that, it also allows you to comment on certain accounts if you like. Now, this is the surface. What happens uh, behind the scenes? Well, whenever you, for example, you want to check your balance on Etherscan, you try to load the Etherscan website, which goes through Cloudflare, because Cloudflare is Etherscan Accelerator. Etherscan returns the balance and everything, plus it also returns the tracker code for Google Analytics, plus the embedded Discuss forum. And this might si sound like a really nice design, really elegant, not too many external things included. But if we start digging a bit into the HTTP protocol, we'll see a few surprises. Notably, HTTP has a concept of referrer. Every time you visit a web page from another web page, you get a tiny extra header saying that you came from this website. The same happens if you embed something. Every time you embed an iframe into your own little uh, website, that iframe will get a ping that you were actually coming from another website. And why is this bad? Well, when you actually load, for example, in this page, it's um, etherscan.io slash address slash 0x whatever. When you load that, Google Analytics will actually have a ping that you, this particular IP address, loaded that particular Ethereum address. Similarly, Discuss also gets a similar ping that this IP address loaded that particular Ethereum address. And is that bad? Well, if we explore what Discuss loads, things start to get a bit weird. Particularly, Discuss has three types of integrations, has social logins to Facebook, Google, and Twitter, which means that Discuss actually reveals the IP to Ethereum address mapping to Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. And it also has these other weird so trackers, kind of like people market, AI, mi mining market, and all kinds of weird, I, I can't read this bit tiny here but you get the picture. So it, it loads a lot of trackers, and not only that, but it also loads a lot of, I think uh, Discuss has 11 integrations with YouTube, Vimeo, and uh, all kinds of other services. And this is an issue because you are essentially associating your IP to Ethereum address mapping, and you're revealing that to a whole lot of external services. And again, this is not to pick on Etherscan here. Any DAP is vulnerable to the same thing. It's just a bit uh, clearer to use with Etherscan. And uh, OK, now we know that there's a problem, but what can we do to actually fix it? So one of the possibilities is, well, first of all, if you're a provider, any kind of DAP or service provider, uh, first up, uh, do not integrate legacy Web 2.0 services. <laughs> and this might sound like a no-brainer, but um, if you think about it in Etherscan, Etherscan has this possibility to comment on accounts. Is that genuinely a useful feature for a block explorer? Well, if you look through the comments, it's pretty noisy, it's pretty spammy. There are a few scams going on, on and off, so it's not, not the best feature. So maybe it would be worth to cut it out. Uh, the second thing is that if you 
even if you don't integrate external services or try to keep it to the minimum, you should always wonder whether it is worthwhile to reveal identifying information in the URL. You should always consider that anyone can access the URL. Let's suppose any, if anyone can access the IP to URL mapping, do you want your customer's data to be leaked that way or not? Maybe for a block explorer, maybe this is, cannot be circumvented. But for another dApp, maybe it should be. And last, of, last but not least, please do use HTTP refer policy restrictions. I, for example, Etherscan uses a policy whereby HTTPS to HTTP downgrades uh, forbid the referral header from being forwarded. There, there are much more stricter policies which actually forbid everything being forwarded. Okay, we can do that, and Etherscan is actually, they are trying to fix these issues. Originally, Etherscan integrated an external ad network that they replaced with an internal, with an internal one. Originally, now currently they are using uh, Google Analytics, but they want to replace that. So they are really open to fixing issues. However, the issue is that um, providers fixing it is not really enough because we can get Etherscan to fix it, but can we get random DAP number 2000 to fix it? Probably not. So users need to protect themselves too. And the obvious choices here are browser extensions that block all kinds of trackers, or if you're on a mobile device, you could, for example, use a Brave browser. But these can only block so many things. For example, if I have YouTube integrated, no, none of the, the extensions or browsers will block YouTube. Which gets us to the second point, that let's suppose we manage to block all the external services, even YouTube, let's suppose we handle HTTP refers correctly and everything. Even then, we have this uh, fairly complex uh, f flow of information whereby whenever we want to access anything related to our data, either via MetaMask, or DAP, or via MyCrypto, or my Ether wallet, we still reach out to Etherscan or Infura or Cloudflare in between. And what this means is that Etherscan, Infura, and Cloudflare still have access to the exact same information, the exact same IP address to uh, Ethereum account mappings. Now, you may trust them or you may not trust them. That is up to you. It's an issue. And unfortunately, the only current solution that you can do is if you use an, an anonymizer service, kind of like Tor, which is willing to hide your IP address behind a mixing network. But kind of that's your best chance currently. So bottom line is using RESTful services is not the best thing. So and if you think now my, my conclusion would be to please use light clients, yeah, that's going to get even more messy. So um, let's dig into light clients. Let's forget RESTful services altogether, all kinds of dApps and web stuff. A light client is supposed to be the, the way to access Ethereum so that you don't have to run a full node, you can just run this really nice little thing, which is essentially kind of feels like a full node, just it's not. And uh, it has actually two significant problems. One of them is in the discovery protocol. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of how the discovery protocol, discovery layer works in Ethereum or in peer-to-peer -peer networks in general, but in short, you have a few boot nodes uh, hard-coded into the client. When you boot up your node, it reaches out to those few seed nodes, gets a whole bunch of peers in the network, and then boom, you're connected. Now, in reality, what happens under the hood is that these boot nodes aren't some magical special databases that track the entire network. Rather, they, the network itself, boot nodes included and all the other peers included, they maintain a so-called routing table on Kademlia DHT, which is kind of a fancy way of putting that everyone knows a little piece about the network. So nobody knows the entire network, but we know little pieces of it. And if you reach out to enough of them, then eventually you can discover and you can, uh, you can discover enough nodes to, to have good connections and, uh, and have a stable, stable connectivity, essentially. The issue here is that uh, in order to do that, so. Essentially, a routing table requires to be able to tell that this, uh, this particular machine is at this particular IP address. That's what the routing table does. The problem is what happens if uh, my IP address is changing? What happens if I have a laptop and not, I'm not running Ethereum on my home server, rather on my laptop, and I keep connecting to the Ethereum network from all over the world? So if I, for example, go, last month I was in San Francisco, last week I was in Berlin, now I'm in Prague, Next week I'll be in, uh, I don't know, London, the month afterwards in Shanghai, and I keep connecting to the Ethereum network via light client, be that a mobile device, be that laptop, or whatever. 
Um, or I can even run a full node on my laptop and do the same thing that's completely equivalent. What the result will be is that every time I connect to the network, I am actually revealing to the network that this machine, which last week was in Berlin, this week is in Prague. And next month I will reveal that this machine, which last month was in Prague, this month is in uh, Shanghai. And this is an issue because uh, this is public information. So anyone in the Ethereum network can at any moment in time see where certain IDs are. And not only that, but if you are willing to do this, for example, every day, just try to uh, scan the network every day, then actually you can create an extremely accurate history of where each individual uh, Ethereum node was moving over time and just nicely plot it on the world map. Now, I'm not sure most people here would be comfortable having their three years of history usage mapped out on a world map. But how can we solve this? Again, it's not an obvious solution. One of the simplest things is that, as I said, the, the main vulnerability is that machines have a fixed IP address assigned to them, and if you move the machine around, then that ID, ID is essentially the global tracker. So we kind of made a cookie tracking uh, on top of the discovery protocol. So the obvious solution, let's get rid of the IDs. So we just bin it. Now, we cannot really bin it because it's part of the Ethereum protocol, but what we can do is make it ephemeral so that every time we restart the machine, we get a new IP, and sorry, new ID. And this has certain implications. One of the implications is that obviously if I'm running a boot node, the ID cannot change. So boot nodes need to have special functionality whereby the ID remains the same. What happens, however, if I run a full node and I just restart it? I did the update, I restarted it. Normally, if the ID changes, that's not such a big problem. In practice, last minute we told in the network that this IP address belongs to a certain ID, and now we are telling conflicting information. And currently, the Ethereum discovery protocol cannot handle that. So if you keep sending in that, you will restart your machine four times, and you're sending in four completely conflicting information into a discovery protocol, then the discovery protocol will just go haywire, and it, you will have a very hard time to, this, to connect to the network. Yes, eventually, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, everything will settle down, but it is an issue. And last but, last but not least, if we actually uh, do the same thing with light clients, then um, we're breaking projects that rely on this behavior. For example, one of them is VIP node, and uh, they are essentially trying to incentivize running full nodes by providing light servers for payment. And then light clients can pay a bit, and uh, then they get uh, the full, uh, light server services. The issue here is that the authentication mechanism they use is that their payment is associated with their node ID. So take away their node ID, and we just blew up the VIP node business model. And this is, I'm not saying that this is, cannot be solved. What I'm trying to say here is that these uh, really trivial issues and trivial fixes ha can have very, very heavy implications on certain players in the network. And often we as client developers don't want to ruin people's days and people's projects. Anyway, so that's the discovery. It is an interesting, uh, interesting problem to solve. Now, if we go further deep into the light clients, then um, how do light clients work? Let's, let's suppose we forget about discovery. Let's suppose we somehow fix discovery. Well, light clients essentially, they connect to full nodes, full servers, which actually have all the blocks. And instead of downloading the blocks and processing them, they are just randomly picking the block headers, which are kind of is a nice enough proof that the chain is valid, but they do not download the state. And then when we start MIST or any other DAP that we really care about, then um, the light client will actually fetch the balance. For example, if I have th three accounts in MIST, then every time a new block arrives, MIST will actually fetch those uh, balances for those three accounts I care about. And again, this seems like completely logical. This is the most optimal way to reduce latency, reduce bandwidth, and just make all the traffic useful. Except um, now, all of a sudden, the light server knows that I am, this IP address is interested in that particular account. Oh, and one more, I think I went a bit ahead. So two more things that I wanted to say about how the light clients work. Uh, so one of them was uh, that they are obviously synchronizing header and then retrieving data on demand, only interesting data. Another really interesting aspect of the light client that I think, apart from protocol developers, most people are unaware of, 
is that light clients cannot verify the state. So they are verifying the proof of work, but they blindly trust that. So every time you get a new block, you just assume if the proof of work is valid, then whatever state that block is associated with will be valid. And this works because if you have a good connectivity to the network and you have many people sending you blocks, then it's really hard for somebody to forge a block because, yeah, they could forge a block, but the, entire, the, network, the rest of the network won't accept it, so after, this, after a few more blocks, it will just get reorged out of your chain. So nobody can really keep attacking you as long as your connectivity is uh, valid. So what happens, uh, yeah, I went a bit uh, previously a bit ahead, but essentially with the light clients and on-demand retrieval, the issue is that whenever if I have missed connected and it every whenever I have an updated block, it keeps requesting the same balance for the same account over and over and over and over again, then light servers will be able to create to statistically map out that this particular IP address is interested in one particular address. And that's a problem because we, back, we get back to the exact same issue and exact same behavior that we had with the discovery protocol, only now we don't have a, um, a, map, a world map of moving uh, IDs, now we have a world map of moving Ethereum addresses. And again, similarly to the discovery protocol, this can be done exactly the same way publicly by everyone. It's a bit more expensive because you need to run a light server. So at least you're helping the network. So please, if you want to attack Ethereum, do this and not the other one. So how can, uh, how can we solve this? And again, it's a, it's a hard question to answer because it's not, it's kind of this is how the protocol was meant to be. This is the optimization. So we're trying to somehow obfuscate the optimization. And um, one of them is again, similarly to how we try to hide our IP address from Etherscan or from centralized RESTful services, we can try to do the same thing and maybe run light clients over Tor but um, what happens if I have an embedded device? So about two weeks ago, no, sorry, two years ago, we already had uh, Raspberry Pi Zeros as light clients on mainnet. Somebody even had these little um, Intel embedded chips put on mainnet, and they were really happy that they, could, they can use the light client. But these devices aren't really compatible with Tor, so Tor has a huge overhead, cryptographic overhead. That's one problem. The other problem is that if we start adding these, um, these IP mixers into the soup and trying to just create, uh, trying to just um, tunnel the light client traffic all over the place, the issue is that you will have connectivity issues. So again, uh, maybe you will find less peers, maybe the latency will go up, the bandwidth will go down, you will keep dropping peers. But the issue here is that, as I said previously, light clients depend on relatively good connectivity. If you have uh, an obfuscation layer that essentially kills your connectivity, then all of a sudden you kind of raise your vulnerability against these kinds of Eclipse attacks. So again, although it seems that there would be a simple enough solution, in practice it's not so trivial. So with that said, um, I think this was the first talk that I did where uh, I kind of raised more questions than talks. <laughs> than uh, solutions, but uh, I still I figure that I would like um, I would like to formulate a few takeaways for for you, just so that you don't don't leave with with the concept that okay Ethereum sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, essentially the the three things that I would really like to highlight as as um, the summary of this talk is that. Um, Although people don't really like full nodes, full nodes are actually the best anonymizers in the Ethereum ecosystem. If you are running a full node, then nobody knows what data you're interested in. You can poke in whatever contract you want, you can check your balance as many times per second as you want, and nobody from the outside will know that you're actually doing it. Secondly, uh, privacy on Ethereum is bad, really, really bad. And that, but this doesn't mean that it's an impossible task to solve. So there have been existing projects, at least two major ones, the Tor network, the Onion Routing network, I mean, and uh, I2P. And both these networks tried to solve this exact problem of how to anonymize data so that you don't reveal too much about yourself. Now, I'm not saying that we should all of a sudden put Ethereum on top of these networks. These networks have a very, very broad scope, and it might be too much. 
But nonetheless, there have been 20 years of research going, going into how to do this properly, so let's try to at least learn from their, their results and try to fix it. And uh, last but not least, um, I've seen it many times in the community, and I see it many times even with myself, that as a developer, it's all too easy to just say that, well, the users are doing it wrong. And uh, for example, it would be nice to say that, well, just use Tor, figure it out. And that's a problem because most users don't know what Tor is, and most users will probably never in their lives use Tor, even though that would be the obvious solution. And it's kind of up, us, up to us to, as DAP and platform developers to figure it out and to fix it. And um, we don't really want to fix it to protect the users from uh, not only from external attacks. I think it's really important to also highlight that we want to protect users from ourselves too. Because I, just to give you a really nice example, I don't think Facebook was created to gather user data. It wasn't created to, to uh, abuse elections. That one just kind of happened when there was too much. <laughs> so with that, uh, I'd like to conclude my talk. So thank you very much. And <laughs> And I guess we have a few possible questions. Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Doesn't look like we have any. Hey, uh, could you talk more about how full nodes are the most powerful anonymizers in the network with that takeaway? Um, so essentially, uh, I, I, um, all these metadata leaks as are possible because you are doing something in, the, you are optimizing your traffic in the network. The only way to optimize your traffic is to request only data that interests you. So every time you are only requesting data that interests you, it means that the network itself knows that that particular data for some reason is interesting for that particular IP address. And this thing you can completely hide with a full node, because a full node essentially gets everything. But this is only for reject searches, so when you write, the anonymity problems still exist. Uh, yes, so that's, an, an, again, another interesting question, that uh, while we are just reading the chain, this completely solves it, a full node, but when we are trying to transact with the chain, uh, then, um, then if, for example, somebody manages, if I'm, let's say, I run a thousand full nodes, and I start monitoring where certain transactions are coming from, then that can be used to eventually statistically hone in on a certain IP address, that this IP address is usually originating some, IP, some transaction. And here, here my solution is, uh, I think, um, for example, IPFS is also looking into exactly the same problem, and um, their solution, or let's suppose their, their ideas are all, re all revolve around the I2P protocol, because it's essentially a message-based protocol that does, um, tries to somehow mix the transaction a bit in the network before popping it out somewhere. And as far as I know, Monero does the same thing for the same reasons. So that's, uh, that's possibly, that's again something that many people before us did and people are doing concurrently with us. So it's not an unsolvable research problem, it's just an engineering problem we, that we have to pay attention to. Yep. Um, thanks for your talk, it was really good. Um, I think probably most people in this room have done all the bad things that you mentioned uh, throughout the talk. So is there anything you recommend uh, aside from running a full node to either like go forward or perhaps anonymize things with these services more? Uh, yeah. Well, I guess my recommendation, I can only recommend what I already recommended within the, within the slides that uh, if you are running, if you are accessing block explorers, I think Browser extensions are the single most important thing. If you, if you are really paranoid, then Tor network is also an essential thing. So that, with, a, with the Tor network, you can completely protect yourself against uh, brow typical browser-based dApp, uh, dApps from tracking you. If, you. if you are actually willing to run a light client, that's a hard problem. That's up to the client developers. Would you recommend us uh, like general rule to <clears throat> regularly clean out the node key? So if you, as long as your server is stable, the node key is fine. I mean, yeah, so if you are on the laptop, uh, I think that that would be the first no-brainer solution that we have to do is we have to keep every, so for example, if you run a light client, every time you run a light client, you, we should 
reset the node keys. We should use ephemeral node keys. Even, even better, I would suggest that maybe even for full nodes, we can use ephemeral node keys and just um, if we restart them, yeah, maybe it will have a bit harder time connecting to the network for the first couple of minutes. So I think apart from boot nodes, no, nothing in the network really requires stable keys. Okay, can we please uh, another round of applause for Peter? Thank you very much.